Hello, everybody. Uh, so I've been very busy at work the past uh, several months, and unfortunately, I can't share too much of what I am working on just yet. So I thought I would take this time this month to uh, take a look back, check out some old notes that I have posted on Twitter over the years that I never quite returned to. So I share these with you, mainly uh, in case they inspire something for your own prototypes or your own games. Um, if you find these uh, interesting, feel free to use them for your own games. I have no problem with it. Uh, you know, have at it. Uh, ideas are not precious to me, so uh, take all of these as you will. Um, so today, uh, I'm just going to focus on a few card games that I never really followed up on. Uh, some old mechanics, some old layout things. Um, and I think this first one is in pretty indicative of the kind of brainstorming I typically do on my own. Uh, I am a graphic designer, I'm an art director, and so very often I will start from the visuals and kind of extrapolate from there. I'll make a card and ask, how does this card get played? What does this mean? Uh, and especially I'll, I'll, I'll usually try cards uh, that don't have that much text on them. I want to see how far I can push uh, iconography without it getting too abstract. Uh, and in this case, the uh, loose idea was that uh, these cards would uh, all have these icons on them. And it would be sort of a tableau builder where you would uh, play cards uh, down in front of you in a line. Um, and there would be some sort of set collection uh, mechanism that would be triggered by the icons that are next to each of these uh, 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 figures. Uh, so the druid has like three of these magic symbols and then like a foot and a uh, health and a foot and health, whereas the bard is more foot, foot, health, magic, health, <laughs> magic, and so on. Um, and uh, I was just building off of fantasy tropes here, but theoretically you could theme these icons to be uh, any kind of mix of attributes or stats that uh, that you'd want and that would be appropriate for the theme of the game. I just use fantasy as a shorthand. Um, but the idea of the game was uh, that uh, once you have put these all out in a tableau, um, you will have these icons available to you, but the number of icons from a card that is available is based on the uh, position in the tableau. Uh, what that means is the first card in the tableau would only give you the first icon on that card. In this case, the druid would give you one magic symbol and you would ignore all the other symbols that are below that. Whereas the bard would give you these two foot tokens and uh, and then you would ignore all the rest of the icons. Uh, the paladin being in the third position would give you three of these sword icons and you would ignore all the rest of those. All the way up to, uh, I guess, position seven and that card on the last uh, the seventh position would give you seven icons, all seven icons that are on that card. Uh, that's uh, That was combined with a little bit of a weird idea where um, you would actually build up your tableau in your hand and uh, the game was uh, sort of a hand builder with a bonanza element where when you uh, acquired new cards, uh, you would have to put them uh, to the right of your hand or to the left of your hand. Uh, I never followed up on that particular restriction, but in general, I liked the idea of how much uh, variability I could imbue into these different character types with just a different mix of icons. Even if they even had the same number and the uh, same amount of icons between two characters, distributing them differently kind of meant something different. Uh, in this case, the paladin, uh, as the paladin uh, moves further to the right on on the timeline or or, or the tableau. Uh, they start off just being very action combat heavy, but then gradually learn the arts of medicine and then finally uh, magic. Whereas the druid starts off with magic and then gradually gets a little bit better about uh, about uh, movement and health or medicine. Uh, again, the themes of these icons were pretty abstract, but uh, I liked the idea of reflecting the growth of a character uh, in these simple sets of icons in certain positions. Uh, I thought the theme of that really uh, came through pretty well. Uh, so next, uh, here's something much more abstract. Um, I was thinking about a, uh, I had a cube pushing game where the, uh, the idea is that you would move, uh, cubes, uh, to the left and to the right on this, uh, on this tableau. And previously it had just been unrestricted where there were, there was no, uh, restriction on the, uh, the number of spaces you could go or where you could go on those spaces. 
Um, and in, in an effort to have some kind of geometry or, or uh, geography uh, in the game, I tried this little idea where you would uh, be able to put your little cubes onto these big white spaces and then they could travel along these thinner white paths uh, from one space to the next, uh, on, uh, only to the next large space. So uh, taking this top row, for example, um, say you're on the top pink space over here, you could uh, traverse to the next uh, space on the right on the gray card and then the black card, but you'd have to skip the yellow card and you would have to uh, proceed directly to the green card, then the purple card, and it would loop all the way back uh, to a dead end, unfortunately in this case, so that would really restrict your movement. So if you wanted to get to the, uh, say, the yellow card from the purple, from the uh, pink card, I should say, um, you would have to go right and then down and then to the right and then to the right to get to the yellow card. Uh, and in this way, I could randomize the layout of of this uh, of these these node maps, and uh, this got extended a little bit to be a little bit clearer. Um, the looping that is got extended a little bit um, thanks to uh, uh, a friend of mine named Finn, uh, who suggested that I just put this on a board and that it loop together. Uh, this idea is from like 2018, I think. Yes, April 17th, 2018, um, and it was a cool idea. Um, Never, never followed up on it. Um, but uh, since this, uh, since I worked on this prototype, uh, another game is about to come out uh, from, from WizKids called uh, Grease Lightning, designed by Kathleen Mercury, um, and that has a much more developed uh, concept for uh, making a modular circular path that uh, you're moving around. It's a racing game in that case, whereas in this one it was more of a, uh, a Euro style, I think pusher thing. Like I said, I never really developed it much uh, beyond this, but it's still a cool idea. Uh, I think it's worth exploring for other games. Uh, here is something even more abstract, uh, even more abstract than that. Um, I was tinkering with a cards with numbers uh, concept. Uh, so cards with numbers, uh, by that I mean uh, games like uh, Six Nymphed or uh, The Mind or uh, The Game. Um, even uh, stuff like Fuji Flush or uh, For Sale. Just uh, I, I love games where the only information that is on a card is just some numbers. Oh, there's another trick-taking game called uh, Little Devils that I really quite like. Um, so this idea is from 2018 as well. Um, and actually the original idea for the card deck goes back even further, but, um, the, uh, but I've been calling this the mirror number deck. And the basic idea of it is that you can have a deck of 54 cards where the two digits on, on a double digit uh, number can be flipped so that a 15 can be a, become a 51, a, uh, a one becomes a 10 because there's an implied zero in front of the one, um, a 43 becomes a 34 and so on. Um, and so by just doubling up your numbers that way, you can get a 54 card deck, which is perfect for uh, production and manufacturing. The trick was I couldn't figure out a game for this. Um, so I tried a few different things, um, never really settled on uh, something in particular. I have one that was about uh, lining up astronauts in a particular order. Uh, it never really quite fleshed out, but um, I was thinking about uh, some aspects of Six Nymphed that I always liked, uh, where certain multiples uh, of certain numbers were worth more points and um, you're trying to avoid points in that case, but it didn't have to be that uh, that way in any other game. Uh, so I, I figured, well, I could find patterns in this uh, in this sequence of numbers um, and signify them visually on the card somehow. So uh, cards that are uh, palindromes, they can have this dotted ray pattern. Uh, if it's divisible by five, it could have a uh, fancy seal around it. Uh, if it's a palindrome and divisible by five, you could have the rays and the seal. Uh, if it's uh, if it's a 10, uh, then the card you know, could have the scallop border. Um, prime numbers would have their own signifier, and the prime numbers that are divided, divisible by 10 would have their own signifier. There's a lot of ways you could do this, odd numbers, whatever, but I never, I never, really, never really figured out anything that uh, quite uh, worked for this, something that was really simple and elegant, like six nymphed. Um, but I still love this deck, and I, I still keep this one handy. Uh, I need to put it up on um, uh, drive through cards just so I can at least sell the deck, and maybe uh, someone else can think of a game for it. Uh, and that would be really that would be really nice. Um, I would love to do something like uh, James Ernest did with pairs, where 
uh, he, he kind of worked on this uh, triangular card deck and then put it out there and uh, inspired a whole bunch of different variants and uh, other games that uh, could be used with that deck. Maybe this will inspire something with you. Uh, here's an odd one, um, really quick. I, I was just thinking about a uh, the myth of the nine-tailed fox the, uh, that is from Japanese folklore, and I thought it'd be kind of funny if you had uh, a little fox that was in front of you and you had a bunch of these cards that have different animal tails on them, and each of those animal tails had their own, I don't know, rules or, or abilities or set collection thing. Um, you know, if it's a mammal tail versus if it's a reptile tail or a fish tail, um, all sorts of stuff would be kind of fun to uh, to play around with here. Uh, but uh, so this concept was from January 2017. And the funny thing is that since uh, since then, uh, another game had a similar idea from uh, Adam Porter. Um, and this is very, very cool looking. I, I always like the, uh, the, the visuals of this. Um, in this game, instead of being a fox, it's a peacock, which totally makes more sense for the fanning tail imagery. Um, it's a trick-taking game, which I always love. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, very cool game, very great uh, presentation, uh, very colorful. I, ju I just really dig it. Um, so if you're looking for something with a similar fanning card idea, I would suggest looking at Picoco. Uh, occasionally, you'll see that I work on some uh, loose ideas for a tile laying game that uses cards, and uh, this is pretty common with me because I I got my start in gaming, uh, tinkering with uh, or playing around with Carcassonne, and I've just always enjoyed the uh, first two uh, modules, the first two expansions for Carcassonne, um, and I've always just tried to figure out ways to like do something with that magic without it being completely just a copy of Carcassonne and. Um, one of the ways that I've tried to explore that is by exploring the actual physicality of cards themselves, uh, doing things that uh, cards do distinctly from a standard uh, square tile. Now, in this case, the way that the, car the card space divides up, if you're going to make four squares on one side of a card, it leaves a little bit of space left over along the bottom of the card uh, that does not quite line up with the rest of the grid. Uh, and so I thought, well, if you were to try to make a tile lane game with these cards using this uh, two by two grid that's on the card, but you left that little bit of extra laying over, you could maybe make a uh, a, a kind of a set collection uh, thing where the uh, the islands that are in the line with that extra bit of card um, will give you points somehow. Uh, in this case, the uh, second card here. Um, that is sort of standing alone here is the uh, longest chain in the line where uh, X equals the length of that chain, maximum of five points. Basically it's saying that you score up to five points for the longest chain of islands in that uh, in that line where that where the, uh, the little tag indicates these arrows to the left and to the right. Um, in this case, uh, you get five points if you have the fewest islands in the line. Uh, I never really quite figured out if this is a personal tableau or if, or if this was a global tableau that everyone was building on, in which case that would require some extra components to indicate who owns that card. Um, each, uh, or perhaps it would there would be some indication of uh, pre-printed icons that were on the island that would uh, represent certain players, uh, blue islands, red islands, or something. Um, I think there are some other stuff here. Most groups of at least two islands. This is something I do a lot is I brainstorm different set collection mechanisms um, just because there are certain patterns that repeat themselves a lot in other games. And I find it easier to iterate on uh, stuff than to just completely make stuff uh, wholesale. Um, but I never really quite came back to this. This is an old one. This is from 2014, uh, September 24th, 2014. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll come back to this. It's a, it's a neat idea but uh, pretty abstract. I just need to figure out uh, how you get cards and how they're placed. Yeah, anyway, moving on. Ooh, boy, this is a big one. Uh, I was working on this for a while. Uh, this image is from uh, May of 2019, and ooh, boy, uh, where to begin with this? Uh, this was a game that I was tinkering with that I was calling Seahab uh, for a little while, and I basically started with this, uh, this inspiration of a book called A um, uh, a Door into Ocean uh, by uh, 
The author's name is uh, Joan Sonschluski. I'm, I'm mispronouncing that name. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, uh, but the title of the book is A Door into Ocean, and it got me thinking a lot about uh, interesting trend, uh, like uh, transhuman uh, visions of the future that are uh, not uh, warlike, that are ultimately peaceful, but still have conflict. They're not utopias. There are, there are things that you need to accomplish. Um, and it got me thinking a little bit more about um, oceans on Enceladus and Europa um, and, uh, and generally about just sea punk stuff. Um, and so the loose idea here, uh, if I could zoom in on some of these uh, images, uh, was that you'd have a sea elevator, kind of like a space elevator that goes from the surface of the uh, surface of the uh, Earth to uh, to space into orbit. The idea here is that you would have a highest upper level that would be on the surface of the ocean that just floats on top uh, and is moored all the way down to the bottom to the uh, to the bedrock. And uh, in this in this case, you would have four of those cards that give you an ongoing um, goal, a set collection thing, or, or something to that effect. Uh, in this case, infomorph transcendentalism. Um, the, uh, the idea is that this culture uh, wants to back up their uh, biological uh, substrates, that is just like people, um, uh, on the uh, in a digital format. Um, so you're trying to get three points per complete and operational habitat pod that is at a different depth. Um, and compulsory anonymity um, is complete is, is another like like weird cyberpunk futuristic concept um, and so the idea here is that you want to get three points per pod that is not adjacent to a pod of the same type and I generally like coming up with very tight succinct sort of sci-fi world building names and flavor and representing that with some simple mechanisms that loosely uh, make that theme make sense. And I don't know if I if I quite accomplished that here, but um, in this case, uh, uplift zealotry was kind of like the the uplift concept, but taken to a to an extreme. In this case, you're getting three points per complete and operational biome pod adjacent to an alien or habitat pod. I don't know what any of this means. I came up with a bunch of names and and icons for stuff and uh, loosely called it. Uh, different things. So in this case, um, on the top left here, starting from the top, there is a habitat pod um, that is a tidal generator, and it is one turbine, um, and it uh, must be complete um, and uh, at the highest depth in order to be scored. And if you are able to score, if this if this is operational, um, then you will get one point per operational turbine. Um, and what does operational mean? Uh, it means that there are two sections underneath this uh, dome that uh, uh, that make it operational. That, that's just all, all it means. Um, oh, wait, no, I got to flip. I'm sorry. That makes it complete. Yes, I, this is all coming to me. Like I said, this is from uh, over over like two years ago now. Um, so yes, uh, you're trying to get these pods complete. And basically that just means that they are a complete circle. And in order to be operational, you have to have the uh, enough crew. Um, in this case, the the two uh, cards below the title generator give it a uh, crew of four and a crew of three, which is sufficient to meet its requirement of three crew, which is noted on the card um, and the, with this uh, digit number three. Uh, and you'll note that the title generator does not give any crew on its own, so. Uh, there's really no incentive to put it any anywhere below the t highest level because you're trying to position uh, and build all of your pods uh, in such a way that they're uh, as many of them are as complete and operational as possible. Um, if they're not uh, operational, they will not score you any points. Um, and so there's a bunch of other stuff here. Uh, let's see. Um, moving down and to the left. Uh, you'll see that there is a science pod that is called the Sonar Network, um, and it scores you one point per any player's complete and operational science pod, uh, which uh, would include itself, obviously. Uh, but it requires a crew of seven, which means that uh, presently the pod that is below it, uh, providing a crew of two, uh, would uh, be 
not sufficient enough. And I don't think I ever decided whether a, an incomplete pod could still be operational. Say, for example, that the alien cep cephaloid consulate uh, that is below the sonar network, uh, say if that had on its own provided seven crew, but the pod itself was not complete, would that still be operational but incomplete? I don't know. It was a weird idea. And uh, a lot of this was just random brainstorming of sci-fi concepts with some scoring mechanisms. Uh, moving all the way to the far right, uh, you'll see that there's a biome pod called Kelp Forest, uh, and it scores you a standard uh, a number of points, just three points, or you'll get one point if you have more habitats than biomes. Um, and so the idea here is that um, you want to have more biomes than habitats, otherwise you'll get a penalty. Uh, but either way, you're going to get some points. It's just going to be not as many as you would wish. Um, yeah, uh, it's, there's all sorts of weird stuff I tried to do with this just to get the theme across. Um, a lot of this is taking uh, just graphics I could find from stock sites and putting them together to loosely look like a sci-fi thing. Um, yeah, it was a wild idea. I uh, never really came back to this. I always think about it, though, and whenever I have a new game idea, I always think, oh, could this work for C-Hub? Could this work for C-Hub? Maybe. I don't know. Um, this is another one of those games where I never figured out what the card acquisition mechanism is. Um, I, I do this a lot, where I will think about what the game looks like on the table, but I never quite figure out what the interaction is and what the interaction between players is. Um, and uh, it, it's probably the, the hardest thing for me to work on as a game designer. But moving on. Oh, yes, this is an old one. This is from July 2015. Uh, I was... Uh, again, exploring what the uh, what I could do with just cards on their own, tiling them together. In this case, I was thinking about um, the uh, the way that a pinwheel could be built from cards, and thinking about making circles out of those and what that would mean. Um, I landed on uh, the loose idea of building a planet, just because uh, again, I, I really like sci-fi concepts, and uh, I especially enjoy the game. Uh, a little prince uh, make me a planet. So as I was exploring this a little bit, I had this uh, idea for uh, somehow getting cards, and you would build up um, the uh, the the planet with, into four quadrants, and the extra icons that were on the outside, on the outer perimeter, would somehow give you some again set collection points. I'm not sure. Um, in, in this first concept I had was was that uh, it was actually a, some kind of trick-taking game, kind of, in, in terms of the the actual uh, core loop of the game. So the uh, so the idea was that uh, planets would be built and the ownership of the different parts of the planet would be indicated by the direction at which the card is pointing. So uh, the card that is uh, the card with the red section here, with the red triangle, uh, it has its extra little bit pointing up towards player three. The uh, card that is yellow with a circle uh, is pointing down towards player one. And that player owns it, I guess. Um, or or that you could only place a card that is pointing towards you to avoid the ambiguity of someone playing a card that you now own, which would be kind of odd, but maybe that's something I should have explored more thoroughly. Uh, but the idea is that uh, completing planets would get you stuff, uh, I think. Uh, it was it was very loose, and I never really did much with it. But um, I was helped greatly uh, by working with uh, Matt Wolf on this concept. So about, gosh, uh, this, this image is from April 8th, 2018. Um, so I was thinking more and more about... Uh, what the planets would look like and i came up with some some artwork here that was kind of neat um and uh, matt wolf and i were tinkering with this for quite a while at uh, meetings before uh, the pandemic hit and we uh, couldn't meet anymore uh, but again i was just tinkering with visuals a lot of the time and i never really nailed down uh, i was kind of flaky on this project to be honest and i never quite committed to uh, coming up with some really nice solid interaction um, again card acquisition is the is the thing where this whole concept never quite fl uh, flourished um, so some loose ideas that we had uh, was uh, starting the game with three cards in your hand and then you flip one of those over to become a uh, 
the what the sun is in the solar system and that would give you some end game uh, uh, scoring conditions that you're trying to pursue uh, we had thought about uh, ships moving around an asteroid field that uh, that would be collecting uh, these cards uh, with some kind of tractor beam um, and each of the cards had different attributes um, sometimes they would or would not have a moon they would have different terrain types uh, they would have uh, astronauts on them or not they would have atmospheres or not um, a lot of permutations that i was exploring um, so the loose idea was that uh, you would move your ship around uh, the asteroid belt um, or you would spend a card to move uh, x number of spaces um, and you had to move clockwise um, and then your tra uh, tractor beam just uh, points straight uh, in a straight line towards the 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 big board of cards and you would collect the the first card that you hit and and then uh, that goes into your hand and from all the cards in your hand you could build up planets in your little tableau uh, or you could use those cards as additions to your sun uh, which gives you just a, a bigger sun but also more scoring conditions um, and never did much with it beyond this uh the the loose idea again was various types of set collection it, it never really gelled with me and at this point um uh i kind of uh handed the ball off to uh to matt wolf and uh and this was not long later um my uh my work schedule just really got in the way and i never really followed through on this so i flaked out on this one this one, this one was my bad but still an idea that i think uh, visually it looks really cool. I really like it, uh, but I could just never figure out what it was going to do exactly. Um, but anywho, uh, that's enough talking from me today. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. This is a kind of an odd episode, I guess, but um, if you're interested in seeing more of this, I have more loose unfinished ideas that I haven't quite uh, finished up or done much with uh, since I initially I uh, posted them, uh, but uh, hopefully some of these will inspire you and uh, and give you some uh, encouragement because uh, uh, just having ideas is good and that's how every good game starts as just an idea. Um, so until next time, I'll talk to you later. Bye.